victorious and strong. Whom shall I fear? Okay, we're going to continue with the service. If you can find your seats. We were just before the break, we were going to show a video, which we're going to show now. This is our ambassador, Stephen, Stephen Curry, who is in Israel, and he had an opportunity to speak to the UN. So we're going to see what, 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 what he said when he was there to the UN, if you want to roll that now. It's about 10 minutes. Now give me great pleasure to introduce a gentleman, a pastor, who's come a long way to be with us today. A pastor who really knows and understands what it is to be on the front line of religious persecution, who deals with it on a daily basis. Pastor Stephen Curry from the Holy Land Missions in Jerusalem, Bethlehem Baptist Church. Pastor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ambassador Otto and Sister Yagoji, thank you for this opportunity. I'd like us just to, um, I want to pray, ask God just that everything we're hearing today would be into action and not just words on paper. And Father, we come before you, declaring you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the God that we believe in. You're a God of love. I pray today that you touch the heart of every individual. May peace reign on this earth. We ask all this in the name of our risen Christ Lord, we pray. Amen. I wanted to invite you into my life story today. As a pastor from humble beginnings, born in Jerusalem and raised in Bethlehem, it's an honor to address the intergovernmental organization today. As a person of faith, I believe this opportunity is not by chance, but a divine appointment. I am simply a voice for those who have been silenced because of their faith. One of the major re reasons for the creation of the UN almost 70 years ago was to, enchant it in, to make sure to ensure the horrors of World War II would never occur again. An integral part of your mission was and still is championing the cause of human rights. In preparing for my speech, I had the opportunity to review a website and was struck by the a photo of Eleanor Roosevelt reading the UN Declaration Rights. In Article 18, it states everyone has the right to freedom, thought and conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief and freedom either alone or in the community with others and in public or private to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and uh, observance. This bold statement I could easily identify with since it's rooted in my Judeo Christian heritage. In the intro chapters of the Bible, it clearly says that a person was created in the image of God. Of course, God only wants his creation to acknowledge him. But he also gave the human being the ability to choose between good and evil. This freedom of choice, which includes the ability to reject the creator as conscious. In the course of human history, we find many examples of human decisions to ignore the image of God within the other and take extreme measures to mutilate and eradicate humanity. When God took the Israelites out from Egypt, Egyptian slavery almost 3,500 years ago, it was a clear demonstration that he wishes that a person should never be enslaved to another. Freedom from human tyranny was a freedom to worship him. While I believe firmly that salvation is only through the belief in Jesus as divine as Savior, I am cognizant of the fact that there will be people who choose not to believe as I do. What is my biblical response to that? My example is Jesus himself, as stated in Matthew 19, where a rich young ruler comes to Jesus after a brief conversation. The man went away sorrowful, choosing not to follow Christ. The selling point here is that Jesus let him go. God does not force belief in him. Faith is a command never coerced. Jesus never declared
Christianity was not birthed in a vacuum. It came out from the womb of Judaism. Well, when Paul brought the gospel to Gentiles outside the geographical location of Israel, it created havoc within the mainstream pagan world. The gods inhabited every aspect of humanity, relations, and governments in Greco-Roman cities. In this God-congested environment, Paul demanded from Gentile believers in Israel's God a complete rejection from pagan life. This denunciation from a pagan standpoint could anger the gods, where their response would be to wreak mayhem by causing famine, flood, earthquakes, and other natural disasters. Believing in Jesus meant committing cultural treason. The response was brutal, and many were tortured and died horrible deaths for their faith in Jesus. Many of Paul's letters address this issue and still encourages believers to remain steadfast in their faith. Some of these letters were written from prison. The one violent prosecutor of believers in Jesus now became persecuted for his faith in him. Many in the Western world read these stories of the early church and persecution they face as stories. There is no reality TV show to bring it to life. To think that in the 20th or the 21st century, the church would experience deja vu would be unheard of. According to VOM and other Orzak organizations dealing with persecutions around the world, this is what they say millions of Christians are persecuted for their belief, which includes imprisonment, torture, death, beatings, and destruction of churches and Christian properties. The radical emits within Islam via ISIS and other extremist groups are forcing Christians to either pay tax, convert, or die. I am no stranger to persecution, and my congregants in some of the radical Palestinian areas have experienced it too. I am an Arab. Please don't run. I come in peace. But I tell you this, I will never forget the physical beating I received by the hands of angry relatives of a young Muslim who came to me wanting to learn no more about Jesus. Nor will I forget the experiences I had growing up, seeing rocks and Molotov bombs thrown out my home and my church property while we were walking out the church services in the late 80s and the late 90s. Nor will I forget some of the most recent problems that we, that we are having since starting in 2010 with the Palestinian Authority, disenfranchising our ministry and delegitimizing our work by not accepting our status as a Christian entity because of things that we believe. Many others and I are still standing for the gospel because we believe in something real that is worth dying for. We are not being asked or expected to kill for. We have counted the cost. I believe if I don't find something worth dying for, what's worth the living? I understand for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Many talk about the eradicating of Christianity or a people, group, or a nation. Today I challenge us, let's elevate ourselves to an equal commitment, but to do the complete opposite. A commitment that ensures the eradication of violence, famine, and war. I propose we refuse to be a should-have generation, but to be a generation that today does something. This is the should-have generation. This is a generation as us today, tomorrow, saying we should have done more, we should have loved more, we should have forgiven more, we should have given more, we should have and should have and should have. Let us be a generation that does something today. Here's the thing. The driving force for many fanatics like ISIS is commitment. Those ISIS ideology, those who carry... Some of them are probably watching today that carry the ideology. I'm going to tell you one thing right now. I am just as committed to die as you are to kill me. Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? There is a price for me to pay today for being here, by the way, because I live in the Holy Land. I live in Israel and the Palestinians.
we just felt that it would be you know interesting for everyone here to see him speak because we support him as an ambassador but you know because he's over there he's never out our way and it's our tithes that you give and also the you know extra giving that we give each month that enables us to, to s support his ministry and when he's out there sharing these things he is he he is our representative we are a part of all that you know I, 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 he's doing yes should we go on Julie, we're just going to go on one. So, we're going to do our scripture reading. Um, Jason, Yaamod. Somebody took my sheet. Yeshua ben Ben <laughs> David. Is that right? Yeshua ben David. Yaamod. Yeshua ben David. Yeah, then you'll never forget. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Alam Asher Bachar Bin Vim Tovim Viratsa Vadivrehem Hanemarim Vemet Baruch Atah Adonai Abocher Batora, Uv Moshe Avdo, Uv Yisrael Amo, Uvin Vieja Emet, Vatsedek. Blessed is the Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who has chosen faithful prophets to speak words of truth. Blessed is the Lord for the revelation of Torah, for Moses his servant, and Israel his people and for the prophets of truth and righteousness. Today's scripture reading is from Jeremiah 23, verses 20 through 40. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? Have I heard what the prophets say who prophesy lies in my name? They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy these delusions in their own minds? Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues and yet declare, the Lord declares. If a prophet or a priest or anyone else claims, this is the oracle of the Lord, I will punish that man and his household. You must not mention the oracle of the Lord again, because every man's own word becomes his oracle, and so you distort the words of the living God, the Lord Almighty, our God. Al ha Torah, al ha voda, al ha nviim, al yom ha shabbat hazeh, shena tatalanu Adonai Eloheinu, likdu shavlim nucha, lechavod ulti faret, al ha kol Adonai Eloheinu, anachnu modim la. Umavarchim otach, Yitbarach shimcha befi kolchai, Tamid leolam vaed, Baruchata Adonai, Mekade shashabat. For the Torah, for the privilege of worship, for the prophets, and for this Shabbat that you, O Lord our God, have given us for holiness and rest. For honor and glory, we thank and bless you. May your name be blessed forever by every living being. Blessed is the Lord for the Sabbath and its holiness. Amen.
Thank you, Yeshua ben David. We've been working our way through the book of Revelation. And um, last week, we looked at this evil, satanic, empowered, and inspired governmental empire that in the Bible is called the beast. And then I also pointed out, not only is this empire called the beast, but the leader of the empire is also called the beast. And we know him better as the Antichrist. And so we took last week talking about the Antichrist. This week, we're going to see another beast. But before I get into the text, I got to figure out why I'm not up on the screen here. Michael, everything looks right on my end. What's that? Everything started, yeah. Due to technical difficulties, today's program, which has been brought to you by water, is going to be momentarily put on hold as we get our technical problems worked through. You want me to reboot PowerPoint or something? I wonder if Jesus ever had these problems with his sermons. <laughs> no bueno. I'm going to flick the switch again. I'm telling you. I like to put my text up on the screen. I don't want to go through a whole sermon without doing that for you, so I'd rather work through the problem now. All right, disconnect airplay. Let's try that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no bueno, no worky. Okay, we're going to take a couple minutes. I'm going to let Michael do whatever Michael needs to do to get this thing to work. And in the meantime, I'm going to start off with some prayer. Please join me. Lord God, I want to thank you for the opportunities uh, that you've given me and the others this week and previous weeks to serve you, uh, to share the good news of Yeshua with people, to love people in Yeshua's name. Um, I thank you for that uh, rabbinic student that you allow me to uh, have a relationship with and to study scriptures with. And I pray that he and I together would grow closer to you, that we would get to know you better, and that he, along with many Jewish people, would come to recognize that Yeshua is the Messiah. Lord, we pray for the nation of Israel. I know the scripture says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we also know that the day is going to come when all nations will be gathered together against Jerusalem. And we fear those days may be soon. We see it in small pieces in the news now. But in the meantime, we pray for your blessing and your protection over those people. Lord, we pray for the persecuted, those who Pastor Stephen was at the UN talking about, those who are being murdered by ISIS chased out of the country, beheaded, tortured, and abused, that you would be with them in a powerful, meaningful, real way, that you would bless them and keep them and make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them and grant them your peace. Lord, we pray for the President of the United States. He has done so many wicked things. He claims to follow you, but we don't see it in his decisions and in his actions. But we know that even as Nebuchadnezzar did many wicked things, and you grabbed his heart, and even as Cyrus did many wicked things, and yet he did your will, we pray that you would bless our president to know your heart and to do your will. We pray for the Supreme Court as they consider legalizing that which you call an abomination that you would do a work amongst them, whether they honor you or not, that they would not be permitted to do this thing. We pray for Martha McSally, 
We thank you again that she joined us at the March of Remembrance. We thank you for her public display of worship at that event and pray that you would strengthen her and bless her and give her wisdom and others in the House and in the Senate who are like her, who believe in you, who worship you and who follow you. We pray that you would bless them and keep them and use them. Our nation has turned its back on you, Lord, but many of us have not. Our fingers are in the dike, holding back the flood. May you bless this nation and may this nation bless you. For we pray, B'Shem Yeshua, in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at that. I didn't even once pray for the sermon, but it still got fixed. Thank you, gentlemen. Well done. So, we talked about the evil empire, which is the beast. And now we're talking about another beast, the false prophet. Here's what the scripture says about him. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Okay, so we have the evil empire called the beast. The leader of that empire, the Antichrist, also called the beast. Now we have another beast, the false prophet. That's why Yeshua ben David read about false prophets. This is the ultimate false prophet. Three things I want to draw your attention to about him. The first thing is he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. He's like Aaron was to Moses. I don't know if you realize this or not, but even though all the movies emphasize everything Moses said and did, Moses, for the good part, kept his mouth shut, and Aaron did the talking. And Moses did some miracles, but Aaron did the miracles in Moses' name and in Moses' presence. So Aaron was to Moses like this false prophet is going to be to the Antichrist. That's the first thing. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. Secondly, he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So he's known as the false prophet because he's the Antichrist's promoter, his cheerleader, and his enforcer. He's the high priest of the religion of the Antichrist. And the third thing I want to draw your attention to is it says his deadly wound was healed. Not the false prophet, it's the Antichrist's. In fact, this is mentioned three times. So you know it's, it's not just important, because everything in the Bible is important, but the fact that it's mentioned three times means that the Holy Spirit really wants our attention drawn to this topic, that the Antichrist gets a deadly wound that's healed. It's also said in verse 3, And I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled, And followed the beast. And then again in verse 14. He who deceives. He deceives those who dwell on the earth. By those signs. Which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth. To make an image to the beast. Who was wounded by the sword. And lived. And I found it interesting. That this false prophet has two horns like a lamb. But speaks like a dragon. He's going to look good but looks can be deceiving. He's going to look innocent. And you can't help, but when you hear the word lamb, think of Yeshua. And I think that's the point. We're dealing with the anti-Yeshua here, the Antichrist and his false prophet. He's going to appear to do some of the same miracles that Yeshua himself did. For example, this Antichrist himself is going to have this mortal wound and yet be alive just like Yeshua was crucified and rose from the dead. I don't know. Is he really going to die and rise from the dead, the Antichrist, or is it just going to look that way? The, The verbiage makes it, I'm uncertain. Could go either way. Verse 13 says, He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, 
telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. So not only does he, the Antichrist, die and rise again, so it appears anyway, that mimics Yeshua, but now the false prophet is calling fire down out of heaven, which those two prophets, the real prophets, did in the previous chapter, the two witnesses. They call fire down out of heaven. And so it's like they're competing. God sent his prophet and his Messiah, and this is what they did. Now the Antichrist is going to send his prophet and his Messiah, and they're going to do the same thing. So that people who are deceived won't know the truth. Well, they did the same things Jesus did. They must be just as good as Jesus. That'll be the mindset of these people. And then he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Whoa, that hasn't happened before. We've never seen that trick. People are going to be amazed at what these people do. So the signs. Um, calls fire down from heaven. Same prof powers the two prophets. Uh, several of the miracles that Moses did were reproduced by the Egyptian priests. So it shouldn't surprise us that these false prophets can do the same thing the real prophets do. Moses turned his stick into a serpent. They turned their sticks into serpents. Of course, Moses' serpent swallowed up their sticks. Moses turned water into blood. The false priests turned water into blood. They were able to do some of Moses' miracles. Not all of them, but some of them. So these false, this false prophet, he'll be doing the same miracles that other prophets have done to deceive. And yet there will be this one that's never been done before, this statue. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast so that the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this image appears to not only speak, come alive, but it's used to kill people that don't worship it. Now how that comes about, I don't know. Does it just point them out or does it shoot laser out of its eyes? I don't know. Who knows? But it's going to so amaze people that they're going to worship it. It says he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. Where did that power come from? A couple of options, as I shared with you last week. The power either comes from Satan or it comes from God. For those of you who weren't with me last week, you might say, why in the world would God give power to the false prophet to allow him to deceive people. That sounds so unlike God, unless God wants them deceived. Listen, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Paul wrote in Thessalonians that God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie. Why? Why would God do that? It said in verse 12 that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There are people who reject good, who reject truth, and enjoy evil and enjoy the lie. And there comes a point where God says, I accept your choice. I liked what Pastor Corey said. Rich young ruler came to Yeshua and Yeshua sent him away sorrowful as a non-follower. Yeshua lets people choose. People can choose to reject him. And they will pay the price for it. But it is their choice. I had a woman call me on the phone the other day asking me to interdict in her adult child's life. And I, as gently as I could, I told her no. He's a grown man. 
He's got to make his own decisions. If he wants my help, he can call me. But I'm not going to go mess with him because you've asked me to. People have the right to make their choices, even bad ones. They all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in righteousness. It's just like God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God will do the same to people who reject him. So it is possible that God gives this false prophet the power to make the idol come to life. Two possibilities then. Satan has more power than we previously thought, and it kept, that power comes from him. Or the second possibility, it's an elaborate hoax. So the power can come from God or Satan. That's one supernatural means. The second one, it's an elaborate hoax. Those are your two options. He actually does come alive, option one. Or option two, it's an elaborate hoax. If it's option one, we don't know. It comes from either God or Satan, but it's supernatural. Second option, it's an elaborate hoax. Now, as soon as I say hoax, you say, ah. But people believe hoaxes all the time, even to this very day. I'm amazed at the nonsense I see on Facebook that people believe. They post pictures and believe the stuff that's in the pictures. I know it's false. Why don't they? They post videos. I know the videos are fake. Why don't they? They post stories. I know the stories are fake. Why don't they? But they don't to this very day. When I say it's an elaborate hoax, something can appear alive without being alive. Now, I have no idea how he'll do this, if it's a hoax, and I don't know that it is a hoax. But let me show you this very interesting video. Got the volume up? Let's take a look. So no volume? All right, well, we don't have to hear what they're saying. It's not that important. You're not looking at a real person. You're looking at a robot. This is an android. She looks very real, does she not? And this is the beginning of the technology, folks. They're going to go better than this. They're going to get a lot better than this. I don't doubt that they're going to get to a point where if you met an android, you wouldn't know it's an android. I mean, look at this person. Look at the hands. It's just simply amazing. And this is not a hoax. So when it says that this wound, this Antichrist is going to get this deadly wound, it's going to look like he dies and comes to life, or that this statue talks, people are going to believe it, whether it's real or not. They're going to believe it. It's going to look extremely real. So it could be an elaborate, ho elaborate hoax based on 2 Thessalonians 2.9. It says the coming of the lawless one. Let me see if I can get that up for you. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of with all power signs and lying wonders. Here's why I say it can be a hoax. That expression, lying wonders, the NIV translates it this way. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders. The Greek could go either way. It could be wonders that deceive, or they could be phony wonders that deceive. It could go either way. So I don't know. I do know that this talking idol will be either alive or appear to be alive. And that it's going to be done by either supernatural means or technological means. But it doesn't matter. Because the believers won't follow it and the non-believers will. Either way. Why do the non-believers follow after the beast? Why do they do that? There's at least five reasons. First of all, he appears to die and rise again. That's going to amaze people. They'll believe it. And they'll think he's the great power of God, if not God himself. They will be worshiping him as God. Secondly is this one here. He's going to call fire down from heaven. Just like the two prophets did. Just like Elijah did. It's been used in history past to show God's power. So they're going to have God's power. They're going to think they're the real deal. Thirdly, 
He'll make an idol be able to speak and breathe. Make an idol come to life. If that's not evidence to the unsaved that this is power of God, what is? It would be evidence to the saved, too, if we didn't know better. But that's why it's written. We do know better. Otherwise, we'd be fooled, too. Because we all know only God can grant life. So we thought. Why else will they follow after the beast? Well, he'll appear to die and rise again. He'll call fire down from heaven. He'll make the idol appear alive. They rejected the truth and loved unrighteousness. Therefore, God sends them strong delusion. And fifthly, or finally, because of fear. Revelation 13, 4 says, Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? He's too powerful. We've got no choice. And verse 15 says, He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Listen, you tell somebody, worship the image or die, they're going to worship. They've got no incentive not to because they don't follow God. To them, it's worth it. But as Pastor Stephen said, to us, it's not. Our faith is worth living for. And our faith is worth dying for. But it's not worth killing for. We don't kill to make converts. We live to make converts, and we die to make converts. Again, fear. Revelation 13, 16 through 18 says, He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast, or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Five facts about the mark of the beast. Okay, so we already know people are going to worship the beast. I gave you at least five reasons, a little more. And one of them is going to be fear, and one of them is going to be force. How are they going to be forced to worship the beast? If they don't receive the mark and bow before the idol, they'll be killed. Well, what if they run away and hide? That's fine. They won't be able to buy food. They won't be able to shop. They won't be able to be seen in public. Five facts about the mark of the beast. Number one, the mark may not be obvious. And I'll go through these in more detail. Let me just lay them out for you. Number two, the mark will be forced. Number three, the mark will be the only way to buy or sell. Number four, the mark will mean you accept the beast. And number five, the mark will mean you're choosing Satan over God, you're choosing the Antichrist over the Christ, and you're choosing hell over heaven. Five things about the mark in detail. Verse one, the mark itself may not be obvious. This calls for wisdom, verse 18. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. Okay. It's calling for wisdom. If anyone has insight, calculate the number. It's not going to be obvious, necessarily. It seems to take wisdom and insight. So we think of, like that picture I showed you, the 666 on the forehead. Maybe it'll become that apparent. But this verse makes me think maybe it'll be a little more subtle than that, which would help inspire people to get it. That's the first thing. Second, it will not be optional. Verse 16, he forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive the mark on his right hand or his forehead. So 20 soldiers show up at your door. With swords and guns, they kick in your door. It's three in the morning. They pull you out of bed. They put an image of the beast there. Bow down and worship it. Take the mark or die. And we're starting with your children. And they hold a knife to your child's throat. What do you do? Most people who don't believe in God will take the mark. To them, it's worth it. Third, 
Thirdly, the mark will be the only way to buy or sell. Fourthly, the mark will mean you accept the beast. It is the mark of his name. You're being stamped with his ownership. How pathetic and disgusting is that? But to save my life. Let me ask you something. How many people do you know live forever? So you're going to die anyway. You're going to take the mark to live another day? How pathetic would that be? Yes, I'll live longer. And you get hit by a bus the next day. Or maybe the soldier who forces you to take the mark just doesn't like you and shoots you anyway. None of us are going to live forever. Well, believers will live forever. Life is not the most important thing. Our relationship to God, the creator, is the most important thing. Investment in the afterlife is more important. Righteousness, goodness, godliness are more important. We have brothers and sisters right now who are being given this very choice. No, it's not 666. It's follow Allah or die. And you know what they say? You've seen them on their knees, not even fighting, letting their heads come off because they would rather die for the glory of Messiah than worship a false god and live under a dictatorial regime for a short time. Just like Moses forsook the pleasures of Egypt to suffer with the children of Israel because he saw what God had in store for him. Our people in the Middle East are dealing with this very concept today. And who knows, someday it may be our concept. So five things. The mark itself may not be obvious. Number two, the mark will not be optional. Number three, the mark will be the only way to buy or sell. Now, yeah, if you live off on a farm, that may not be a big thing. But for most of the world's population, we're city people. The only way we get food is buy it. And the way we make a living is by selling and buying, selling and buying. No business opportunity without the mark. People will take it. And the fourth thing, the mark will mean you accept the beast. The fifth thing, the mark will mean you're choosing Satan over God, the Antichrist over Christ, and hell over heaven. Those who receive the mark of the beast are doomed. This is not an option. I'm going to take the mark and worship the beast, but not really mean it. I'm just going to do it so I don't die. No, this is the line in the sand. You don't have the choice. You take the mark, you've chosen Satan. You don't take the mark, you haven't. It's that simple. Scripture is very plain about those who take the mark. It says, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or on his hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises up forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast in his image or for anyone who receives the mark of his name. Well, these are going to be dark days. So why am I teaching you this? You're not there. Scripture is interesting. Book of Revelation says, Blessed are those who hear the sayings of this book. Why? We're not there. You realize we may be? I don't know who this is talking to. This may be talking to us. This may be three years from now. I don't know. Maybe whoever's going to be living through this is going to be watching this sermon on YouTube. We'll all be in heaven. Maybe they'll be. I don't know. Chapter 14, 12, about the people living in those days, says this. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Yeshua. Patient endurance gives a whole new meaning to patience and endurance. For those who are alive, they don't know where they're going to get their food from. If they get caught, they're going to be executed. That's patient endurance. It won't be easy to follow God. 
For many today, it's not easy to follow God. But the end results are always worth it. It's an investment that cannot fail. Here's the end results. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. This is your inheritance. This is your future. I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Yeshua and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they came to life and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. Those who were abused, those who died, they come back to life. They reign with the Messiah for a thousand years. Instead of reigning with the beast for a day, a month, or three and a half years, they reign with Messiah for a thousand years. It's a good trade-off. But it doesn't end there because after the thousand years, there's a brief interlude. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. It's a deliberate choice. Suffer now for an eternity of good and righteousness. Or don't suffer now for maybe a few years. No, no, rephrase that. Don't suffer as much now for maybe a few years for an eternity of suffering. It's that simple, people. We have to understand it's that simple and present it that simply so that people can make a choice. It's left or right. It's yes or no. Some people choose foolishly. I was told growing up to stay away from drugs and alcohol as all of you were told. And yet some people become alcoholics and drug addicts. They were given the same choices, the same options. We were told crime doesn't pay. Don't do the crime if you don't want to do the time. So we decided we didn't want to do the time. We didn't want to hurt people. We don't like people stealing from us. So we're not going to steal from them. We don't like people mugging us. We're not going to mug them. And yet other people choose a life of crime. They don't like people. They don't care. They want to take your stuff. They don't care. They'll do it. Nothing's changed. In the spiritual world, it's the same thing. In the physical world, you may have chosen to avoid drugs and alcohol, and you may have chosen to avoid crime. But what about your spiritual life? Have you chosen to follow Jesus? It's the same choice choice for goodness versus the choice for non-goodness. The choice for righteousness versus the choice for unrighteousness. The choice for heaven versus the choice for hell. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. History culminates into a simple choice. God's Messiah or Satan's Messiah. For us now, Satan's Messiah is not here. So we have one choice, God's Messiah or not. God wants to make all things new, but he wants to start making you new right now. If any man be in Messiah, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. For those online and those in the house this morning who have not yet made a decision to follow Yeshua, I'm going to lead you in a prayer. 
It's a prayer that you can make your own or not. It's entirely up to you. But I want to show you how to do that, how to make that decision, should you choose to do so. And if you've already made that choice but haven't had the prayer yet, please join me. Lord, I believe in you. I believe Yeshua is the Messiah and the Savior. I believe he died for my sins and rose from the dead. Up to this point in my life, I have not chosen to follow you, but I do now. I will obey you, and I will serve you to the best of my ability. Thank you for loving me, and it's in Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. If you've made that prayer your own, please reach out to myself or Michael. We'd like to take you on the next step of the journey, learning to study the Bible, uh, have baptism, and uh, let you know about your new faith. God bless you hard.
Please bow your heads for the benediction and you'll be dismissed. May the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. I'll see you over in the bistro. God bless. You're dismissed.